Andreas is um, actually one, I, I think, one of the most interesting people anywhere. <laughs> I think you're going to agree with me. He is a true polymath, a person with encyclopedic knowledge, a learned education. A learned education and a storied career. He was an undergraduate at Oxford University and at Harvard. He worked, at, and at Harvard he worked with John Rawls and Robert Nozick and wrote his PhD dissertation under their supervision. As an associate professor of philosophy, he has been at Brandeis since 1986. He has also been a Fulbright Fellow, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow, and a Fellow at the Institute for, Ad for Advanced Study at Princeton. He's also taught at, the M at MIT and has been a visiting fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and Harvard's Center for Literary and Cultural Studies. He has a great variety of courses here at Brandeis, which include human rights, democracy, and disobedience, also philosophy of law, as well as a course on politics and markets, philosophy and public policy, and a course on aesthetics, on painting, photography, and film. Recently has been uh, teaching in the, in the Introduction to Philosophy course at, at Harvard in the summer and at Brandeis in the fall. And he's also taught, among other courses, What is Justice? and a course on the good life, or How Should One Live? He also has a storied career, though, in theater and in film. He's the founding He's the founder and artistic director of the Cambridge Theatre Company, which produced its shows at the Hasty Pudding Theatre in Harvard Square from 1992 through 1998, and which gained the reputation as Boston's leading off-Broadway theatre. In 1998, the theatre company was awarded the Elliott Norton Award, Boston's highest theatre honor for the best production of the year. And he's also a member of the board of the Century Theatre Center in New York, which produced the premieres of Edward Albee's play about the baby and Paul the vocals, How I Learned to Drive. After he graduated from college, he starred opposite Richard Burton in the Columbia Pictures film, Dr. Faustus, <laughs> as, Mep Mep as Mephistopheles, All right. with Burton as Faust and Elizabeth Taylor as Helen of Troy. <laughs> And Andreas, professor of philosophy, also spent a year in Hollywood appearing as a guest on a number of television series, among them I Spy with Bill Cosby and Robert Culp and The Big Valley with Barbara Stanwyck. And if you look at the web as I did the other day to see photos of, uh, of the young, handsome Andreas Teuber, I encourage all of you to go, go look at the web. So I don't know today whether he's going to appear uh, today as an actor or a philosopher, or both, but uh, the still handsome Professor Teuber will speak to us uh, about Dr. Ndekar's teacher and mentor at Columbia University, the American pragmatist, John Dewey. so you can go away with something, um, and you feel like maybe got something out of the lecture, i.e. the handout. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, the, all that um, that Larry had to say, I mean, is actually, I did these things seriatim. I think that's a word. Um, and uh, that means that I was did some acting, but I did it as many of you might have done any other thing, like going out for rowing, when you went to college, it was an extracurricular activity and it just got out of hand. <laughs> and my family was very worried that I would become an actor and, uh, you know, like, have a terrible life. Um, and I sufficiently absorbed my father's sort of grumpiness to be able to sort of very quickly come to my senses and continue my schooling. So, uh, it, the problem is the internet, 
Larry, but the internet, is, it brings up what is spent, what they spend most time on, and they they have a lot of things kind of figuring out who was in what when, whether it's a television show or a movie, and so that rises to the top, and then people keep getting it, and it's on the first page. But I don't think I've acted for you know a long, long time, and I'm not quite sure how to do it. <laughs> so I, I don't think I, I can appear even here in that guy. So now I've used up all my time. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to say something about, I think some of us feel that we actually didn't choose the topics that we're speaking about. We actually were assigned them by Larry. Oh. And uh, <laughs> Larry's going to say that. I mean, we may have kind of, we may have tried to get within the area of our, <laughs> <laughs> Within the area of what we actually think about, um, I'm a philosopher, John Dewey is a philosopher, but many of us who now teach philosophy in the English-speaking world do not read John Dewey, um, and John Dewey is thought to be a little bit of an odd duck and an odd person out, but obviously a fascinating philosopher. One of my first teachers was somebody named Hilary Putnam, who's a very dyed-in-the-wool analytic philosopher that he's very concerned about clarity and the like. And he's come to think that maybe his view, he's not absolutely sure, but maybe his view about the moral life is actually very dewy. Right? But what I did, since I thought of it also as an assignment, was to read Embed Carr and to read Dewey. And I had somehow thought that I might have been third act. And so that Professor Thorat would be speaking in between because he's going to speak on the annihilation of the past. Is that correct? Yeah. And I actually went through the annihilation of caste, and next to me, I had Democracy and Education by John Dewey. Democracy and Education was published in 1916, the year that Embed Carr got his PhD, and they must have been talking about it. We don't know very much. There's almost nothing written, very little written, about Embed Carr and Dewey. But I've come to think, I'm not sure I'm going to convince you, that Dewey is a key to understanding um, uh, Embed Carr and certainly understanding the annihilation of caste. So this is going to just raise many more questions than it's going to answer, but I'm going to try to say enough to just sort of whet your curiosity. Is that the right expression? Um, and um, and, uh, and to, to say something about their connection. Part of it will be just simply reading, putting passages side by side, say, oh, look, this is what Dewey said. Oh, now here's a bed car. And it looks like it's almost the same set of sentences, only they're a little bit jumbled up. And so, uh, and then it's not actually that jumbled up. Sometimes they're just lifted. And they're not, there are no quotation marks around it. They're just right there. And um, I don't think it was done inadvertent, uh, you know, done it uh, deliberately. He loved Dewey. And he saw in Dewey, I think, a kind of religion. Uh, he didn't have to be religious to have a philosophy of life, and Dewey provided it for him, and he uses it as an alternative to what Gandhi talked about. Um, and when Gandhi tried to refer to things, usually from the past, about what the model should be for Indian government or how we should move forward, Gandhi would look back, and Bedkar seems to have gone to Dewey. <laughs> finds a framework, and then picks out certain things as a result of this uh, framework. So maybe I'm going to do very quickly, and it's going to be totally inadequate, um, but maybe you might be spurred to sort of do some of this yourself, is to say a couple of words just about John Dewey, and then go back and kind of start talking about the two of them and the two of them together. I, I thought that what Professor Thorat had to tell us yesterday was astonishing. It was so rich and so full that many of us um, are still trying to sort of sort this various thing out. Um, I, I think you're, you're willing or make available this, the, you actually have a paper for this, and I immediately asked him for it. I think everybody else should too. I, I don't need <laughs> to jam your email box, but, um, but I'll, I'll say some things uh, just quickly about Dewey. Some of you may not know Dewey at all, and some of you, where we are, are we here? It, you've, you've, oh, I see. I think what the problem is. Okay, so 
Um, I'm going to turn this down a little if it doesn't make it too dark. That makes this dark. Does that work? Yes. Is that okay? That's okay? Okay. So, um, um, These are sort of when they wrote the book. I mean, uh, and Bedkar wrote Annihilation of Cass um, in 1936. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 1936 it was published. I mean, he didn't write it. It was a speech. But you're going to say something about this. But let me just say, I mean, he was going to give a speech. He then never gave that speech. And then he published it, and he self-published it. And they were 1,500 copies. Um, we have the cover of that book, I, mean, I suspect it might be quite rare and, and might be worth a, something. Do you have a copy <laughs> yeah. of that first uh, that first run? Uh, not necessarily, but yeah. we can discover it. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I, I immediately wanted to get a hold of it. Right, right. You know, only 1,500 copies. It's an astonishing document. Um, anyway, he wrote uh, in 1936 and John Dewey did Democracy and Education in 1916. And he refers twice to John Dewey in The Annihilation of Caste. So I'm going to start with the actual references to John Dewey. And he's thanking John Dewey. He did this many times throughout his life. He said he was very indebted to John Dewey. So John Dewey was born in 1859 and died in 1952. And as you know, and Bedkar was born in 1891 and died in 1956. So they, they, they kind of converged, more or less. I mean. But clearly, Dewey was older. Dewey was born in the same year that Darwin published The Origin of the Species. I don't think Dewey was aware of this at his birth, <laughs> but we are now. <laughs> it's also the same year in which John Stuart Mill published On Liberty, 1859. So it was a sort of a, a good year. Dewey, <laughs> no. right. and, um, and uh, um, Darwin. Uh, and he was very taken with Darwin later in life, and he thought that one of the ways that he always brought into his thinking a kind of Darwinian view of, it was not Darwinian in a hard sense of Darwin, but it was a Darwin that he thought thinking evolves, and it's constantly evolving, and it never sits still. Um, and that was also the view both of, both, and Embedkar picks this up too, and the notions they have, both democracy and education, are as involving, evolving institutions, constantly changing, needing updating and, um, and correction and so on, which then tells you something about the nature of the kind of citizens that will be best, and the students, what the teachers should be doing in school, given just even this very simple fact about it. Anyway, do we... Um, uh, didn't really start out in philosophy, but um, wrote an essay in philosophy, was always taken with philosophy, and uh, sent it to the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, and it was accepted, and so he thought, oh good, maybe I can do philosophy. Um, uh, he went to a, a number of places before coming to Columbia. Uh, it was at the University of Michigan, for example. Um, uh, but. And then at the University of Chicago, there was a disagreement. He actually resigns in 1904. And in 1904 or 5, the biggest and the most, the highest philosophy, the, the, part, the department that was really the most active was at Columbia, and they snapped him up. Um, and that's where he was till 1930. Um, Dewey was uh, at, at Columbia. And then he retires. He doesn't stop working, and he continues to churn stuff out in 1931. So ironically, he gave the William James lectures at Harvard, um, and it was on art as experience. Um, uh, and, um, uh, that, and so he continued to publish and to write, and that book has become somewhat uh, widely read um, as well. Um, but uh, he started out thinking about knowledge and the nature of knowledge. Then he sort of moved to metaphysics, whatever that might be. Um, and then he moved to social and political philosophy, even ethics, and uh, ended up talking about aesthetics. 
So he was one of these philosophers that really sort of did the whole thing. Philosophers tend not to do this. Philosophers now imitate the sciences and they tend to focus rather narrowly on one little area of philosophy, which is probably unfortunate, because if there's somebody within the university that should be thinking about everything, that's probably the philosophers. And they should probably do work in other people's backyards and not just sort of turn in on themselves and do their little narrow work. But that's how it's being done now, but not so with Dewey. Um, who arrives in 1913 but Ben Carr to study? And he's there for three years, 1913 to 1916. His first actually written work was actually delivered at a seminar in anthropology in 1916. Um, and uh, he wrote a lot about, uh, he took every, as far as we can tell, and again, the research needs to be done. So if there's anybody out there that wants to do research, it's just not been done. How many classes of Dewey's did he take? How often was he there? What did he do? It's very interesting. Um, the reports are that Dewey had a big effect on him. Um, here's a report from a newspaper by Clark Bate, a newspaper account that is included in a couple of things that have been written about his experience with Dewey. And Bedgar took down every word that the great teacher uttered in his teaching, telling his friends, if Dewey died, I could reproduce every lecture <laughs> verbatim. Uh, which, if you read Annihilation of a Cast, it looks like he does. <laughs> right. Right, um, you know, and, and, like, and he, uh, I don't know, maybe he's doing shorthand or something, but he, he seems to have really been taken by it. Um, another essay that's been written uh, by, uh, on Dewey, there, there are only a couple that I could have find, and I think Professor Thorat thinks there's another one. He's going to find it. We're going to dig this stuff up, right? Um, but um, unless we understand, he said, unless we understand something of John Dewey, it's impossible to understand a bed car. Um, so Dewey was at Columbia from 1905 to 1930, and bed car was there from 1913 to 1916. Um, Democracy of Education, as I've said, was 1916, and then a car is the annihilation of caste. So, um, and here's the first edition of Annihilation of Caste, the cover. And um, then, uh, whoops, uh, I, whoops, now I've really done it. F5. Uh, what, what have I done? Made it bigger, right? Or just go to F5 and... Uh, go to F5? Yeah. F5. Where's F5? Next to F5. Oh, is it F5 is on here? No. I bet maybe it's just something you can hit. Actually, there. How did I get there, though? You want to go back? Yeah. These are, um, now I'm going to do some uh, quotes, and I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm actually done now, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> now, I, I wanted to go through some of the quotations, both from both texts, and I'm not going to do a lot of work here. That is, uh, I mean, I don't think I need to do a lot of work. It's actually astonishing to see how close these quotations are, and therefore, he doesn't, you don't need a bed car to tell us about his debt to and Jim Dewey, you can actually see it in the writing. And if you can do this with just two books, because there's just a lot published now of embed cars, um, uh, it's worth sitting with a number of the Dewey texts and then also the number of the embed uh, car texts and see how much sort of finds their way into them. Um, but here I've been doing, I'm just basically doing democracy and education in one head and annihilation of caste in another and just going back and forth uh, between them. And one of the things he does is he uses words, and some of the words are very odd. Dewey uses them, and you see them then in a med car and immediately are alerted. So it's not even that difficult to find these comparisons. He uses odd words, you know, or he uses metaphors, like talks about bricks, and there's bricks in, in Dewey, and there's bricks in uh, and bed car. He talks about endos. End, endosmosis, and um, so what does that mean? You're reading embed car, and you see, oh, this is a very key term for Dewey, and actually then you understand what maybe embed car is saying, 
by going back to Dewey um, and used to go back and forth. And I didn't know any of this when Larry said, well, why don't you do something on Dewey? <laughs> but I didn't know that this then. So this is good if Larry thinks he probably didn't assign us these things, <laughs> but you should just seek out Larry and ask him for an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> it leads to great new ideas and work. <laughs> So here, here, here he's, um, he's starting to quote uh, from Dewey. And I'm going to just read these two quotes. And those of you that know a little bit of Inventgar, and you've got to know a little now because of a lot yesterday and listening to Professor Thorat. But Hindus, but this is now Inventgar. Hindus must consider, from Annihilation Cast, Hindus must consider whether they should conserve the whole of their social heritage or select what is helpful and transmit to future generations only that much and no more. Already quite political, quite action-minded, right? He wants to make a difference and so on. Um, Professor John Dewey, who was my teacher and to whom I owe so much, has said, every society gets encumbered with what is trivial, with dead wood from the past, and with what is positively perverse, set this against Hinduism. As a society becomes more enlightened, it realizes that it is responsible not to conserve and transmit the whole of its existing achievement, but only such as make for a better future society. Now, one of the things that Dewey is generally thought to have been was a pragmatist. He was sometimes called an American pragmatist. Some of us think that's kind of redundant. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you know about pragmatism, that's a practical philosophy. And Americans tend to be a very practical people, at least so myth has it, right? I mean, and so when we get into trouble, we move, right? We buy elsewhere, we move west, we pick up, we go, and so on. We, we're, we, well, we manage. We're interested in sort of how things work. We have books with lists. We like lists. <laughs> Top ten lists and so on. This is very American. <laughs> I, I don't know if all the other countries now have picked it up. It's unfortunate if you have. It's food in your culture. <laughs> but we, we, we like this facts. Americans are big on facts, and we have a strong strain in America of anti intellectualism. Right. Um, so, um, er, uh, but as a society becomes more enlightened, it realizes that it, is, that it is responsible not to conserve and trance the whole of its existing achievements, but only such as make for a better future. They both were pragmatists in the sense they also thought truth, if truth doesn't actually come to something, if truth is not useful, truth is empty. So they actually had a very radical view about truth, both William James and uh, Dewey, and he learned a lot from James, and James comes before Dewey. But these are the American pragmatists, and they had this pragmatic view of truth. Um, and uh, it seems to have been shared by Embedekar. And it goes sort of louse the philosophy. And I know that it was mentioned that he quoted, he was quoted yesterday as saying, philosophy is dry, but not John Dewey's philosophy. It's actually in here, and it's going to come up on it. But not John Dewey's philosophy or him, because for John Dewey, thought and action were intertwined and couldn't think if you couldn't then get action out of it. And if you weren't acting as a result of what you were thinking, you probably weren't thinking. Um, so uh, then here again, Hindus must ask whether they must not cease to worship the past as supplying its ideals, um, and supplying its ideals. Hindus must ask whether they must not cease to worship the past as supplying, I'm sorry. So as supplying its ideals. This is now Embedkar. We've gone back to Embedkar from um, the baneful effect of this worship of the past are best summed up by Professor John Dewey. These are the two quotes that are in Annihilation of Caste. An individual can live only in the present. The present is not just something which comes after the past, much less something produced by it. It is what life is in leaving the past behind it. The study of past products that will not help us to understand the present. There hadn't been this conversion moment to, to Buddhism till 20 years later, right? But you can already hear it in this, right? You can already hear an anticipation of putting the past behind in order to move forward. 
But no, taking from the past whatever might be useful, but leaving the rest of it maybe behind, because we're living now and we want to be alive and well. This is going to then connect up to their views about democracy. I probably should be stopping, um, but uh, you should then just stop me. Uh, a knowledge of the past and its heritage is of great significance when it enters into the present, but not otherwise. This is now. And the mistake of making the records and the remains of the past the main material of education is that it tends to make the past a rival of the present and the present of more or less futile imitation of the past. This is do, uh, Dewey. Um, uh, the, those, that's the continuing quote from the Annihilation of Caste. Both quotes come uh, right from our, our Dewey's Democracy and Education. Um, a few passages later in Annihilation of Caste, and Ben Kerr writes, the assertion by the individual of his own opinions and beliefs, his own independence and interest is over against group standards, group authority, and group interests is the beginning of all reform. But whether the reform will continue depends on what scope the group affords for such individual assertion. And here's Dewey. It's shorter, but every new idea, every conception of things differing from that authorized by current belief must have its origin in an individual. Each individual sort of thinking, that means you have to create a democracy and a school experience where this, the, the pupils in the school and the citizens in the democracy have sufficient openness and flexibility to have the next best idea. Right? Not be kind of enclosed and trapped in a kind of particular way of thinking or a particular form of life, right, even. When Gandhi looked back for his model for a government of India, for India and his image of the good society, and Bed where he looked back, and Bedkar drew upon Dewey as his religion for his blueprint for Indian society. This is me. We could debate this. Philosophy may be dry, but not Dewey's philosophy, not for Embedkar in any case. In response to Gandhi and his backpedaling, Embedkar looked to a world through Dewey's eyes. If you ask me, my ideal would be a society based on liberty, equality, and fraternity. And why not? What objection can there be to a fraternity? I cannot imagine any. Now, many American writers, in philosophy at least, in the 20th century, talked a lot about liberty and equality. My teacher, John Rawls, wrote an egalitarian theory of justice, and the whole point of the book was largely to reconcile liberty and equality. He would actually describe that's what justice did. It reconciled those two. Um, most, uh, most economists focus on liberty and equality as well. Um, and fraternity is sort of left sort of out of the equation, but not for Dewey. And then where, where does Dewey say this? Um, oh, uh, here. An ideal society should be mobile, should be full of channels for conveying a change taking place in one part to another, other parts. In an ideal society, this is still in Medcar, about what an ideal society is. Uh, there should be many interests consciously communicated and shared. There should be varied and free points of contact with other modes of association. Association, the word association becomes really critical. Uh, that is another word that Dewey often uses for fraternity, an associated life. So that whereas many Americans might think the most important fundamental right in the US Constitution is free speech, or it might be privacy, which even ain't in there, right, but that we feel like we have, uh, for Embedkar and for Dewey, the right to associate, mix and mingle, cross, not have boundaries between you and the next person, right? To be able to talk to them, gauge them in conversation in some sort of dialogue, right? To meet them, to greet them. You know, this is the future for democracy. That's why democracy is a, a good thing, right? And you can think differently. But you've got to kind of have an opportunity to communicate. You have to kind of get it to be fluid. Um, in other words, there must be a social endosmosis. This is fraternity, which is only another name for democracy. This is in bed car. Endosmosis. I stumble across this. I said, where does that come from? I've already sort of done something with it. But this is Dewey now. This is Dewey through and through everything that we, we just heard from in bed car. Inside out and up and down, 
this is doing almost nearly virtually verbatim as if he's taking down a lecture. Right, right. Now, you don't need to just take my word for it. You could actually go through this and do this for yourselves. Uh, and Bedkar, remember, who said, if Dewey died, I could reproduce every lecture verbatim. There are passages in the Nihilishna cast that reproduce the thinking of democracy and education in places help to clarify it. Tempting one to say, you want to understand democracy and education? Read on Bedkar instead. <laughs> Dewey did not use the phrase liberty and equality and fraternity in his writing, but Westerbrook, who's his biographer, says that the tip, no matter democratic ideal for Dewey, Dewey told his class, he would often tell his class, that the democratic ideal in his political ethics classes was embodied in the slogan of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. By combining liberty and fraternity, one arrived at a positive conception of freedom individuality operating in and for the end of the common interest. This is clearly picked up by Embedkar. More research is needed, but I'm willing to be a bet a sizable amount of money, I don't have a ton, that Embedkar was in that class. <laughs> I mean, you know, but we'd have to see, right? And the above passage continues, and Embedkar says, Democracy is not merely a form of government, it is primarily a mode of associate. We could learn from this. I mean, the Americans. <laughs> no, I'm just screwed. Democracy is not merely a form of government, it is primarily a mode of associated living, a conjoint communicated experience. It is essentially an attitude of respect and reverence towards one fellow citizens. Men. A democracy is more, and here's Dewey, a democracy is more than a form of government. Is he, reading, is he reading Dewey, perhaps? <laughs> it is primary, or remembering it. It is primarily a mode of associated living, a conjoint communicated experience. The, these more numerous and more varied points of contact denote a greater diversity of stimuli to which an individual has to respond. There's a key idea in, Demo in Dewey that democracy was not merely a means for selecting one's governors, or of holding, should have a G, <laughs> elections every two or three or four years. It was a mode of life, a way of living in the world, democratic living, and Embedkar believed it too. This is the social side of Embedkar, but also of Dewey, which is if you don't have a social, a democratic life, you can't have a democracy. <laughs> but you don't have the social underpinnings that are essential for it, you can't have a democracy. See, and then osmosis, it was a key idea in Dewey, and it's key to his idea of democracy. And Bedkar adds the adjective social when he speaks of it, he often puts it in, which will may also be a little bit redundant, given the way they understand it, both of them. Uh, but which shows how committed he was to not changing, to not just changing politics and law, but to a total social transformation. Here's Dewey, a society which is mobile, which is full of channels for the distribution of a change occurring anywhere, must see to it that its members are educated to personal initiative and adaptability, and that is endosmosis, that, that, that kind of fluidity. Endosmosis is actually a chemistry term, uh, comes from chemistry. Um, it's used elsewhere. Louis Dumont uses it, but Louis Dumont, we now know, is a Johnny-come-lately because he does much later, already the writing on cast has been done by somebody like in Bedkar. In short, there are many interests consciously commuted in education, shared and varied in face points and free points of contact with other modes of association, a large variety of shared undertakings and experiences, otherwise the influences which educate some into masters, educate others into slaves, Separation into a privilege and a subject class prevents endosmosis. Um, so there's hints of the caste system, but it's hints of any kind of social stratification, any kind of walls, any kind of segregation, any kind of uh, society that has social groups within it that have different values and beliefs, but their walls that start to build up between those groups is destructive of the democracy because it doesn't allow for endosmosis, which is this fluidity, and the fluidity in chemistry is the interpenetration of, 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 of boundaries. Of, of, it, it sort of, it, it, it's, it's a sort of a porous seeping in and seeping out. Um, uh, and um, uh, 
interdependence of a porous membrane, interpenetration of a porous fluidity, free forming. Dewey picks it up from Bergson originally, Henri Bergson, whom you may know. Um, done, right? Okay. So um, I'll, I'll do one, uh, one more, two more things, or you're not going to let me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I, yeah, but the two points selected by which to measure the worth of a form of social life are the extent to which the interests of a group are shared by all its members and the fullness and freedom with which it interacts with other groups. Um, a society which makes provision for part participation in its good in its good of all its members on equal terms and which secures flexible readjustment of its institutions through interaction of the different forms of associated life is in so far is, is that is is democratic. Now there's more, I've, I've got more quotes, more quotes from Abidkar, but this will tell you if you just turn it on its head that so when when does democracy really function and work? It's when you remove social stratification, when you remove, when you get rid of the caste system. Can't, that, that India cannot even be a viable democracy. That is not just for uh, Dalits. That is for everybody in this society. Um, um, so that's, that, I'm going to end there because of time, but we will have a little bit of a discussion session. Thank you for doing this.